Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session, which is going to be focused on surveillance technology, different level of accountability. Let me first introduce the speakers. On my left, Marwa Fatafte, MENA Policy and Advocacy Manager at Access Now, and the coordinator of the MENA Coalition to Combat Surveillance, MCCS. Access Now is a non-profit organization founded in 2009 with a mission to defend and extend the digital civil rights of people around the world. On my right, Asia Abdul Karim, researcher at the Iraqi Network for Social Media, ANSIM. ANSIM is a network of bloggers and social media trackers on a number of uh, issues that concern Iraq. Ansem serves as a great tetable source of accurate and verified news and updates of the digital rights in Iraq. And with us online, we have Samuel Jones. Samuel Jones is the president of Hardland Initiative, which is a non-profit a practice-based research organization that promotes the fundamental rights and freedom of people in conflict-affected and high-risk areas. So let me talk about the coalition, the MENA Coalition to Combat Surveillance, launched during the public session at Riot Cons on the 7th of June 2021. The MCCS, the coalition has come together to end the sale of digital surveillance tools to repressive governments in the MENA region. Fight for a safe and open internet, defend human rights, and protect human rights defenders, journalists, and internet users from government's prying eyes. The murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi on the 2nd of October 2018 demonstrated both the dangerous consequences of targeted surveillance and the extent of secrecy and punity in which authoritarian governments in the region can obtain and deploy sophisticated and oppressive spyware tools. Until now, there has been no real accountability in the killing of uh, Khashoggi. The Saudi uh, government still never held account for his killing and the killing of other activists. While the NSO group, as you know, managed to hack into the accounts of many internet activists using the biggest of spyware. I have also to mention the case of my colleague, Ahmed Mansour, a member of the board of the Gold Center for Human Rights, who is the first victim of Pegasus spyware back in 2015. It is the same year in which he got the Martin Annals Award for Human Rights. Ahmed was arrested on the 20th of March, 2017, torture and sentenced to 10 years in a prison only for his peaceful and legitimate human rights work. He is still in solitary confinement since his arrest. He, his family, friends, and we, his colleagues, have paid a heavy price for the use of surveillance technology against him. We are all still in pain. Now back to the NSO group. Uh, it says that uh, it builds because of spyware solely for governments to use in the counterterrorism and law enforcement work. But as I said, many of my colleagues, many human rights defenders, bloggers, journalists, and internet uh, activists, they were victims of Pegasus spyware. Now, I want also to talk about the level of accountability. There is no any local mechanism to address massive human rights violations in the MENA region. And as such, 
by using the concept of international jurisdiction, the Gulf Center for Human Rights filed a complaint in France on the 28th of July, 2021 against the Israeli software company NSO, which is responsible for harm caused to human rights defenders in the MENA region. The case is still ongoing. Now I will ask each distinguished speaker to present a brief summary of their work and the level of accountability they focus on. Let me start with my colleague Marwa. So Marwa kindly outlined the plan of actions for the MENA coalition to combat surveillance and the work you intend to do on accountability. Yes, Marwa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much, Khalid, for, and the Gulf Center for Human Rights for putting this session together. Um, as Khalid mentioned, Access Now and the Gulf Center for Human Rights uh, launched at RightsCon 2021 um, the MENA Coalition to Combat Surveillance. And that came from the urgent need to combat the proliferating use of commercial spyware and uh, digital surveillance tools in the MENA region. We, as Khaled had already highlighted, um, we have in different countries in the MENA region uh, have been investigating and exposing the depths and the spreads of how spyware, um, digital surveillance tools like NSO groups, Pegasus spyware, among others, are um, used systematically to target, monitor, and surveil human rights defenders, journalists, lawyers, uh, civil society from Bahrain to Morocco, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, Egypt, you name it. Um, and therefore, we decided to bring local organizations together with global organizations to fight this phenomena. The issue of spyware and surveillance, as we all, I mean, for people who work on this issue, um, it is a transnational issue. Uh, for one, there are companies that are outside of the MENA region, or, you know, in this case, Israel is one of the top exporters of these surveillance technologies. Um, that in order to fight, in, in order to combat this industry, we need to strengthen solidarity, but also information exchange and advocacy tactics between civil society organizations. That's number one. Just looking at the transnational or cross-border nature of the surveillance industry. Another important fact here was, um, or factor was the fact that many activists and human rights defenders in the region are activists in exile, especially after the Arab Spring. And the spyware has enabled their countries to um, uh, to target them while they're abroad, uh, to spy on them, um, to uh, forcibly disappear them, to kill them. I mean, the case of this year, we have commemorated the fifth anniversary of uh, Jamal Khashoggi's murder at the Saudi embassy in Istanbul. His fiance, his acquaintances, his son, his ex-wife, um, even their lawyers, all of those individuals have been targeted uh, with Pegasus spyware. So again, we're talking, just to you know, emphasize again on the point that we are dealing with a cross-border transnational issue that requires um, a collective commitment to fight the proliferation of spyware among civil society. Now, in terms of the plans, of course, we are dealing with uh, a ghost-like industry. It's extremely opaque, uh, elusive. Um, companies are hiding behind shell names. Um, their investors are also uh, just as, as elusive. The transfer and the sale of these technologies are highly secretive. There is no way for us, for example, to know whether X country, you know, X government, like has the government of Egypt contracted or had uh, bought sp specific spyware? There is no way for us to know. The only way is to investigate through working with affected individuals. And Access Now, among other partners, we have built uh, recently our uh, forensic anal an analysis team that we would be able to. Um, receive cases from uh, human rights defenders, journalists, and activists to investigate and see whether their devices have been uh, infected or targeted. Um, the same goes with our partners like Amnesty International, Citizen Lab, among others. Uh, so the first, 
objective here is to um, investigate and expose um, the, the companies and the human rights abuses that result from the use of um, the products that they've sold to the governments. The second thing, once we have exposed, you know, we've published reports we, we, uh, on where um, activists and victims have been targeted and what the result was in terms of human rights abuses. Uh, the second thing is looking at accountability venues, and that's, of course, the name of the, the panel, which, is, which has been you know, hard because, for one, you know, when, victim, when a victim recognizes or have, are told, like, once their device is, is checked, that you have been infected with Pegasus, they are traumatized. Um, if you're a human rights defender, you're also afraid that you might be harming the communities you work with. Um, and then the question becomes who targeted me and attribution is becoming harder and harder. You know, for example, we can check if someone has been infected with Pegasus, but who was the government behind this infection is, is becoming difficult. And that is important for accountability, especially at an individual level. Um, people want to know who is the per who is the entity or the government spying on them. Um, and then they are also seeking uh, litigation. They want access to remedy. And in, in most of, I mean, on all of MENA countries, you can't uh, just go to court and sue NSO group or sue the government uh, because of lack of rule of law uh, and law enforcement. And therefore, the question always for us remains, how can victims seek remedy or have access to effective remedy when there is none in their home countries. And we have been exploring with the Gulf Center um, ways we can uh, overcome this, this hurdle or challenge. For instance, um, I mean, the Gulf Center and Khalid maybe can speak about this, have filed um, a lawsuit against NSO Group in France on behalf of a number of human rights defenders in the MENA region. We have also collaborated most recently, a few weeks ago, um, in a lawsuit filed against Emirati surveillance company Dark Matter, uh, which has uh, hacked the, the device of the prominent Saudi uh, woman human rights defender, Lujain al Hadloul, uh, together with three of its US executives who have um, helped set up uh, the Dark Matter's surveillance operation. Um, now, the, of course, the company is trying to kill the, the lawsuit in the U.S. on grounds that the, the victim and the, the company and that the U.S. court has no jurisdiction over, over these individuals. The victim is Saudi national, the company is Emirati, and the lawsuit is taking place in the U.S. And I'm a bit simplifying the matter, but this is the summary of it. And we think, we, you know, we wrote to the court an amicus brief emphasizing again that those, this victim does not, does not have access to uh, effective remedy, would not be able to sue either Dark Matter or the UAE government for spying on her, and therefore the court can, see, can actually exercise its jurisdiction to uphold human rights and most importantly send a message to the surveillance industry that they can indeed be held accountable. Thank you a lot, uh, Marwa, and uh, let me just ask you, uh, uh, briefly about uh, what about your efforts uh, in relation to human rights uh, due uh, diligence uh, advocacy efforts in relation to uh, put a, uh, an end to this cooperation between uh, companies and democracies supporting oppressive uh, governments in the MENA region? Um, that's an important point because, um, again, like going back to the to the issue of the surveillance industry itself, where it comes from, where is it exported from, and in in some instances, like for example, the German company um, Finfischer. Finfischer. Yes, yeah. I forgot the name. Uh, Finfischer, and now thank thankfully they declared bankruptcy in Germany, but they had provided their surveillance technologies to the UAE, to Egypt, uh, to Turkey. And so here again, <laughs> we go to the um, to the issue of export controls and the role of so-called democratic countries in exporting or making the surveillance uh, technology available to authoritarian regimes. Uh, often, and you know, even though there are some export controls uh, in place, these technologies find their way in the hands of authoritarians. Um, that use them to target and, and attack human rights defenders and journalists. 
Our role has been to expose mm -hmm. where expert controls have been lacking and also to add pressure on governments uh, <clears throat> to regulate that industry within their, their jurisdictions through enforcing bylaw accountability measures that, for example, companies that work on surveillance technologies have human rights due diligence in place in order to uh, stop selling the, that tech to, to human uh, rights abusing countries, uh, among other issues. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Marwa. Let me move now to Asia. And Asia, could you just uh, tell us about uh, the work of uh, ANSIM in empowering human rights activists in Iraq against the, the civilians uh, uh, and digital attacks, and also what level of accountability we have in Iraq? Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this session. Actually, uh, for those who is not know, uh, Ensem Network is a network for social media working uh, in a group of digital right defenders and digital experts. We have been working in Iraq since 2011 as a non-governmental and non-profit uh, CSO to advocate for a free, diverse, and safe internet in Iraq. Uh, so we are a part of this MENA alliance and MENA uh, coalition to combat uh, surveillance. And before I begin to explain in detail, I want to tell those who don't know and emphasize to those who do, who do that Iraq is a country that has experienced many wars and conflict uh, over the years in various forms. As these conflicts have involved, evolved, so have the capabilities of civil society activists and human rights defenders uh, in dealing with these uh, disputes in a new way. So we now have a concept say, of digital resistance, which has become increasingly prevent in recent years uh, due to its uh, significant uh, importance in changing the course of events. And uh, regarding your question in Iraq, uh, human rights defenders increasingly rely on digital technology, technology to monitor and advocate for human uh, rights, or to share their opinion, promote uh, debate, and mobilize. Nonetheless, malicious actors such as pro-governmental groups, including uh, militias, have also used these online platforms to threaten intimidate and harass activists. With the rise of massive uh, use of social media in Iraq, digital privacy and digital security have never been more important. So in some in Iraq play a vital role in empowering uh, internet activists uh, uh, against civilians and digital attacks. And we do this by uh, providing trainings and uh, resources uh, uh, on digital security and privacy, documenting and reporting uh, on a cases of civilian and digital attacks, advocating for policies uh, and laws that protect digital rights, supporting internet uh, activists who are under attack, and monitor do and document digital security threats uh, to civil society in Iraq to provide training and resources to help civil society uh, organization to protect themselves. Uh, and some work has been uh, instrumental in empowering internet activists to resist civilians and digital attack. So for example, Ensem has provided, um, as I said, uh, many of trainings uh, and we documented uh, numerous cases of civilians and digital attacks against uh, Iraq, uh, against uh, the activists in Iraq. Um, uh, let me talk uh, more about the hacking uh, of activists for arrest using civilians technology. So Ansem have documented that a lot of apps that have been compromised which lead to severe arrests. Uh, as reported by a protester, I caught him. Uh, we would turn up to an area to hold a protest and find a masked militia waiting for us with the knives and uh, clubs. Activists in Iraq face various forms of digital threats, ranging from hate speech to misinformation, hacking attempts, etc. In this regard, through our platform, The Checker, we aim to remain uh, awake 24-7 to detect any attempts uh, to spread mis uh, misleading information that could lead to deadly consequences. Uh, tragically, we witnessed uh, the loss of two valuable uh, individuals, uh, the activist Reham Yaqub and uh, 
politician and journalist Hisham Al Hashimi, who were assassinated uh, following um, a very uh, massive online campaign by electronic armies affiliated with uh, Iranian backed militias back in 2019. So we, le we lost these two brilliant uh, due to the absence of effective uh, deterrence of the a time to stop the harmful disclosure. However, today we are uh, striving to protect the lives of these defenders with all the tools and connections at our uh, disable from f by our platforms. Uh, also, uh, I want to mention that. Um, just one second. The level of accountability in digital rights in Iraq are promoting is still in a very uh, early stage. However, there are some promising signs like involving NSEM with a member of parliaments in various discussion regarding cyber crimes, law, data protection, and access to information. Um, however, there are also uh, some challenges that NSEM face. The Iraqi government has a history of cracking down on decent and human rights activists are often uh, often targeted by the government and non-state uh, actors like the Iranian-backed militias. Additionally, the Iraqi government is often uh, slow to implement uh, reforms, and it's unclear how long it will take for the government to pass uh, and implement laws uh, that protect digital rights. Uh, despite these challenges, we are playing a vital role in empowering internet activists uh, to resist surveillance and digital attack. Uh, these tactics are helping create more open, diverse, and a democratic internet uh, in Iraq. Um, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Asya. Now, just briefly, could you talk about uh, your plan for uh, future work and actions in relation to this important topic? Yes, Asya. Yes, of course. Uh, so now we have a lot of uh, plans, actually. Um, we are maintaining a direct communication with the Iraqi political leadership, especially the Media and Communication Commission and the Ministry of Communication. We continually send the reports of these violations and hold meetings with them to emphasize the importance of recognizing uh, the digital human rights are none less significant than natural uh, human rights. And we also engage with an international press release to put uh, pressure on these authorities. Uh, this can be an effective method, time, uh, method at time, given the influence of external political uh, interference in Iraq uh, and the consequences it can have. Yeah. Thank you a lot, uh, Asia. Now uh, it's time to move uh, for our third distinguished speaker, our colleague Samuel Jones, who is uh, joining us online. And uh, the question for you, uh, Sam, is how can investors help uh, advance uh, corporate accountability for civilians related harms, including uh, these associated uh, with authoritarian uh, governments? Yes, Sam. Thank you. Um, so first of all, ex uh, sincere thanks to Khalid for uh, the opportunity to participate in this timely and critical discussion. Um, second, I wanted to mention that I've been fortunate enough to live in both Palestine and Iraq and once again find myself following Palestinian and Iraqi women who are both smarter and more articulate than, than I am. Uh, that said, I'll, I'll do my best to, to respond to the question. Um, so just a quick note about Heartland that will help set the stage for my remarks. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, Khalid, we're a practice-based research organization that assist investors in preventing and mitigating human rights risk across their investment portfolios, specifically those associated with business activities and relationships in conflict-affected and high-risk areas. While we work across industries, we have spent considerable time over the last several years prioritizing surveillance technology as a particularly at-risk sector in these particularly at-risk contexts. Um, some of the most pronounced re recent human rights crises have underscored the severity and systemic risk posed by surveillance technology, whether that's the Russian state surveillance system SORM being used against Russian distance or to control Ukrainian internet traffic, the deployment of spyware by the military junta in Myanmar, the surveillance state created by the Chinese government in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in Tibet, 
or the use of targeted and mass surveillance throughout the occupied Palestinian territories by the Israeli government. In other words, if you introduce these high-risk technologies into areas where the human rights regime is already failing to function as intended, where regulation and enforcement are either inadequate or used in rights-violating ways, or where systematic or episodic violence and abuse are a part of daily life, you can expect these products to exacerbate these issues unless companies have taken, as Marwa alluded to, the necessary steps to address human rights and conflict risks throughout their product life cycles and specific to their business models. And yet, in spite of the rather obvious heightened risk endemic to the use of such technologies, whether that's in Palestine or Iraq, the vast majority of companies producing surveillance technologies or those producing technologies that can be used for surveillance, like cloud-based computing, for example, do not conduct a correspondingly heightened version of human rights due diligence as called for by the UNGPs. And this is where investors come in. Investors are becoming increasingly aware that human rights risks to people due to high-risk products and services, high-risk value chain relationships, or in high-risk context can translate into financially material risk for companies and their shareholders. This could be due to regulatory enforcement, strategic litigation, operational disruptions, or brand damage. And there's perhaps no greater example of this in the tech space than the company that's been mentioned before, Israeli spyware maker NSO Group. Thanks to the investigative research of Citizen Lab, Amnesty Tech, Access Now, the reporting of forbidden stories, which detailed the global human rights harms emanating from the sale and use of Pegasus spyware, NSO Group became the target of strategic litigation by WhatsApp and Apple, regulatory blacklisting by the U.S. Department of Commerce, government investigation in the EU, and international advocacy campaigns like the Pegasus Project. And collectively, these efforts resulted in massive financial and reputational costs for NSO Group, which was deemed valueless to its private, e private equity investors during a London court case in April 2022, only three years after being purchased for $1 billion. Now, while NSO Group may represent perhaps one of the most egregious cases of surveillance-related human rights harms, there are numerous other examples where investors have the opportunity and the responsibility under the UNGPs to engage companies whose business models is, uh, are at risk of contributing to surveillance-related harms in high-risk environments. Some examples include Google's decision to partner with Saudi Aramco and Saudi Telecom to build a cloud platform in the kingdom where surveillance-related risks are both severe and well-documented. Nokia's products and services being used to connect Russia's digital network with state-run surveillance system known as SORM to suppress dissent and surveil citizens. A range of surveillance-related systems, including biometric technology from French company uh, Talos Group, supplied to the Egyptian government, which is creating a massive surveillance infrastructure in Cairo. Celebrite, owned by a publicly traded Japanese company, Sun Corporation, selling digital forensics and intelligence tools to Myanmar's military junta, and Western Digital selling hard disk drives to Hikvision to be uh, packaged with that company's surveillance offerings, which have been used as part of the Chinese government's surveillance and internment program in Xinjiang region. So as regulators and policymakers struggle to keep pace with the proliferation and use of these and other technologies globally, it's become even more critical for investors to directly engage companies and encourage rights-respecting behavior from the design to the end-use stages. In other words, in the absence of effective regulatory frameworks, investors represent a key potential driver for improved corporate policy, practice, and governance, corporate accountability for human rights harms, and most importantly, better protection for rights holders. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly try to concretize this point uh, by reflecting on several potential roles investors can play vis-a-vis -vis surveillance technologies. First, many of our investor partners have exclusionary screens for controversial weapons that are fundamentally incompatible with international humanitarian and human rights law. So think about nuclear, chemical, biological, cluster munitions, and landmines. 
We're currently working with some of those partners along with Access Now, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and other experts to develop similar criteria for spyware, meaning that it would necessarily be excluded from investment portfolios due to the emerging discourse suggesting that spyware is also fundamentally incompatible with international law. While many public equity investors are not, may not directly be exposed to spyware, since the sector is largely funded by private equity, these massive investors in North America, Europe, and elsewhere could send a strong public signal that spyware is fundamentally a toxic asset class. Second, and especially in light of emerging regulations around surveillance technologies and mandatory human rights due diligence in Europe, there's a role for investors to play in directly engaging policymakers concerning the need to put into place laws governing the design, marketing, and use of targeted and mass surveillance among state and non-state actors. There's both actually a human rights imperative and a long-term financial interest for investors to adv advocate for the development and adoption of fit-for-purpose rules for these technologies that can contribute both to, and most importantly, a reduction or prevention of human rights harms, uh, but that also erode public trust in state institutions and destabilize the condi conditions that make for a prosperous economy. And third and finally, investors can continue to engage companies, those in and adjacent to the surveillance technology industry on improved policy, practice, and governance measures that more effectively identify, assess, prevent, and mitigate surveillance-related harms. In order for these engagements to be truly effective, though, investors must be equipped with techn technically sophisticated research and analysis, like that provided from our colleagues from Palestine and from Iraq, um, so that companies aren't able to out-tech them during these dialogues with investors. And this is where civil society expertise becomes critical providing investors with the resources they need to have conversations about contractually, operationally, and technologically preventing and mitigating these harms, even in authoritarian and other high-risk contexts. So I'll close my remarks there. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for joining us at such a late time for you. Thank you for mentioning Palestine and Iraq. Uh, briefly, I have another question for you, Sam. What are the future plans for Heartland Initiative around surveillance technologies in particular? Yes, Sam. Sure. So, yeah, so um, I appreciate the question. Um, as I mentioned, we work across industries, but in the next 12 months, um, we're planning some fairly specific activities around surveillance technology. So first, um, an effort to designate spyware as a toxic asset class among public and private equity investors. Um, inspired by the anti-personnel landmine movement, this will include the development of investment exclusionary criteria that I mentioned previously, but it'll also include a white paper on the severe human rights and financially material risk associated with this technology, um, investor and company collaborations designed for these stakeholders to work together on mutual threats posed by spyware and its exploits, um, a global majority gathering designed to more fully integrate grassroots civil society experts um, into, uh, or sorry, experts on targeted surveillance into directly into investor-led company engagements uh, and working with partners to map out the spyware ecosystem. Uh, and then second, I would mention uh, building off an event uh, that Heartland Access Now and the Resource Center held in London on the abuse of surveillance technologies in MENA. Um, we'll be working with coalition of North American and European investors to engage a handful of tech industry leaders in private collaborative discussions on concrete and meaningful ways to address surveillance related risk um, through better market entry analysis, improved harm and value chain mo monitoring and contractual and operational human rights guardrails. So the point of that is moving away from these 30,000 foot policy discussions with tech companies focused on the UNGPs and really focusing on the operational uh, impacts of their technologies on people on the ground. That's, uh, and I'll, I'll close there. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for all this work that has the potential to enhance the protection of all of us. Now we open the floor for any question, comment, discussion, or any online question. 
Do you have any comment, any question? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Stephanie Mickelson, UNFPA. Um, so I look at kind of the gendered aspect of all of this. Okay. Um, this is still, yeah, I'm learning a lot, so thank you again. Um, I was wondering, you know, if, if this is, if that gendered element of like human rights defenders is something that, that we consider um, and analyze as we have these reports and as we move forward, yeah. because as we know, you know, <laughs> clearly, you know, two yeah. of the four people uh, um, here today are, are women. I, so yeah, I would just like to hear a bit more about that if we, if we can, thank you. I think Marwa will address that. Yes, Marwa. Uh, yes, take this. <laughs> Thank you, Khaled, and thank you for raising this question. Um, we have actually um, um, started looking at the, at the gender dimension of uh, targeted surveillance. Uh, as someone who has worked with um, surveillance victims in the MENA region, I know firsthand, and as also as a woman from that region, I know firsthand how scary it is um, to have your personal information um, or let, let me rephrase, to have a, an adversary government that is hell-bent on destroying your character, especially if you are a, a woman human rights defender or a human rights lawyer or a journalist, a woman who works on public interest or human rights activism, um, and to have all that personal information weaponized in order to, to smear your reputation um, and to discredit you and delegitimize your work. And so just to take a step back, you know, we have been working on um, how women are targeted generally online uh, from doxing campaigns, and that is sharing um, images or um, information uh, about women without their consent, including like their home addresses. We have seen cases where the, even the addresses of the women's uh, children, like uh, the addresses of their children's kindergartens or schools, um, medical records, uh, sometimes even um, uh, sexual activities, uh, intimate intimate uh, conversations, screenshots of WhatsApp conversations and whatnot. Um, women sometimes when they are on the streets protesting, we've also seen cases with their devices confiscated. Um, so we know firsthand um, as an organization that deals or provides support to those at risk communities, how dangerous it can be if a government has its hands on that personal information and what it can do with it. And now adding to that layer, spyware. So if, if uh, for, let's take a Pegasus spyware as an example, and that's not the only spyware uh, available on the market. There are many other um, commercial spyware tools. Some we know of, some we don't. Uh, but, you know, once your device is infected, the government client pr pretty much has access to everything, everything. Your micro can turn your microphone on your, on your phone on so it can spy on your conversations, uh, your camera, um, telephone, you know, telephone calls, messages, contacts, emails, even in, um, encrypted messages like on Signal or WhatsApp where you think that you are communicating safely with individuals, but in reality, all of that is being exposed and seen by the, the government. Now, um, for women, the impact of targeted surveillance is particularly egregious, because one, women are subject to gender-based violence online and offline. Um, they are, they, you know, they are afraid, it kind of restricts their, not only it violates their privacy and, and also restricts their ability to express themselves or express their right to freedom of expression and opinion, but also it restricts their movement. It, women feel, like women I spoke to that have been spied on uh, feel uh, afraid to walk on the streets. They have to change tracks, for example, because they feel that someone is, is following them. Um, they know that if they are physically targeted or um, assaulted or harassed, they won't receive any legal or social protection. Because again, like going back to gender-based violence, especially in, 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 in a region like MENA, where women are being killed and harassed without any consequences or little support. Um, and therefore, uh, for us, it was very important to advocate 
or to add, you know, to, to emphasize that targeted surveillance is a form of gender-based violence and should be for women rights groups, for you know, UN agencies, uh, for and to develop like international norms around that. That targeted surveillance is not. We're not only talking about the right, uh, a violation of the right to privacy, but also in the case of women, it's a it's a, a form of gender-based violence. Thank you, Marwa. Yes, I see you have something to add. Yes, yeah, so I will talk from the side of Iraq. Uh, during the past year, I was working on uh, digital-based violence research. And in this research, we met with uh, more than 100 uh, Iraqi women. Uh, we did an interviews with them. Uh, most of them, uh, in the conclusion, we found that they uh, have faced uh, digital uh, violence. Uh, most of them are f so afraid to face uh, this uh, truth. It's, it's truth, as Marwa said, they are very f afraid to go to the police and to report that they are facing a blackmail or a hate speech or any other uh, threat, online threat. So because of the traditions, uh, especially in a closed uh, community in Iraq, they are so afraid to be killed. And I mentioned one of the story of the YouTuber Tiba Ali. Uh, she, she was uh, uh, reported to the community police in Iraq that her father is uh, threatening her to, to be killed because she uh, ran away with the runaway uh, outside Iraq because of uh, he was he, she was uh, facing a domestic violence. So they make her to, uh, to they make the dad to make a commitment to the police that he will not be uh, targeting her they will be uh, a good uh, father for her. And the next morning, she was dead. Uh, so the, the women in Iraq are facing a lot of digital violence we would reflect on the earth. And this is a very important ch challenge, actually. Uh, so in Iraq, also, uh, the pornographic image is not just uh, that w what it's mentioned in the world. And pornographic may be that um, to spread an um, image of a girl that wear a hijab, but it uh, spread an image with Without hijab, so that will be uh, targeting her uh, from the community. Uh, so uh, we are trying for, uh, for NSM actually. Uh, we launched a hotline uh, um, help desk. Actually, we receive a lot of uh, blackmail uh, cases. Uh, we're trying to help them uh, because, they, as I mentioned, as Marwa mentioned, they are <coughs> sorry. They are so afraid to be in a court or in a police station. Uh, so we are trying to help them, but it's a very challenge. Uh, actually, it's a global challenge. Uh, we are trying, and we hope uh, finally, any soon, we will uh, do our best to help all these women. Uh, one minute. Uh, I have little doubt that, uh, no doubt at all, that uh, uh, digital tax on women, human rights defenders, should be regarded as uh, gender-based violence. And uh, really little uh, have been conducted in research with regard to the psychological impact on women when they are uh, going to be victims of uh, spyware such as, because uh, we have colleagues such as Abtissam Saq in Bahrain, Hal Ahed in Jordan, uh, they were victims of Pegasus, and uh, it has uh, a huge negative impact on their family life, and it's still all that uh, never properly research. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. I Do you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to add a comment to this discussion. I'm Fatima Fanis of the Internet Alliance. Um, that uh, it is a gender-based form of violence also because, and that's the part of the iceberg that we do not see, like every woman in this region, but also more generally, who is slightly being an activist or <laughs> uh, more on the spectrum is afraid of their being surveilled or their information being released because of that reason. So even before being surveilled, it does impact women's lives, like yeah. uh, any gender's lives, of course, but women to a greater extent in societies where they're more targeted and um, the impacts and they have to basically adapt their activism and their lives to the potential threat, which is another way of oppression. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Yes, please. I, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Um, especially when, at least in the MENA region, they, the whole notion around morality and how women should behave, how should dress, how should 
um, conduct themselves in public, that's already policed even before these technologies were, were invented and now deployed on a, ma on a, on a, on a sp you know, increasing scale. Um, we have, for example, cases where, you know, um, Khalid mentioned Abtizam al sair who is a Bahraini human rights defender, and she, uh, we published a report together with frontline defenders um, show, showing how she was uh, surveilled and targeted. And she told us that even in her home, like once your privacy is violated, especially right now with our devices becoming an integral part of our lives, it felt like an assault or an attacker in her own kind of bodily integrity, and she doesn't feel safe in her own home. Um, as a veiled woman, she's you know a pl practicing Muslim. She doesn't even feel like free to be herself at her own home. At home, she has to wear the veil at all times, and that's that. Also, have you know have we have uh, had similar testimonies from Palestine. You know, maybe it's a separate issue with um, not targeted surveillance, but mass surveillance and facial recognition technologies pointing directly through the windows of people's ho houses or homes. And there women also express that they have to wear the veil at all times. So just to share the um, how intimately that impacts women on levels beyond what, what we uh, can imagine. Thank you a lot, Marwa. Is there any comment, uh, any question? If there is nothing, I go back to Sam. You, you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, hi, uh, I'm Isao Matan from Japan. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, uh, both of you, um, the, uh, I think uh, the surveillance is, uh, se has secondary effect uh, on us because after two years, uh, the Pegasus article was broke, uh, published, we are so intimidated, even in uh, even uh, Western, uh, Western yeah. world journalists, we, we, are, we are very afraid to yeah. contact with uh, you or human rights activists or other journalists. So some journalists are feeling that uh, we feel very hesitant to uh, cover such uh, activities or organizations. What are the secondary effect after two years uh, the Pegasus uh, was revealed? Uh, are there any uh, hesitation or the shrink of activities in your uh, spheres or countries? Want to answer? Uh, well, um, I think always we have to uh, com confront uh, perpetrators of our privacy. Uh, the right to privacy is a human right, and uh, we shouldn't wait. We shouldn't uh, be afraid from uh, doing all what we could, whether it's uh, human rights litigation or taking uh, proper actions to stop uh, companies from uh, uh, attacking our rights, including the right to privacy. I agree with you, it is not easy now to communicate if you have sensitive information, but uh, the tools are out there for you to make sure that uh, your privacy is respected and not compromised by companies. Uh, and as a journalist, I really encourage you always to uh, find the truth and always to uh, shed the light on the uh, activities, illegal activities of companies who are supporting um, uh, opp oppressive uh, governments in our region, MENA region, and other regions, uh, as uh, it is very important for us to show solidarity and to cooperate and to work together in order to end this business of uh, surveillance against us. Uh, human rights defenders and uh, other citizens. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Khalid. I'd like to add two points. One, thank you very much for raising that point. This is precisely uh, one of the key impacts of targeted surveillance. It's not only about the individual that is targeted or infected with a malware or a spyware, but also the communities that they live uh, or interact with. So um, this this second-hand trauma or the second-hand impact, uh, journalists being afraid to speak to their uh, contacts and resources confidentially, um, human rights organizations not being able to corroborate uh, 
uh, evidence of human rights abuses or sp speak to um, local sources on the ground, and that's especially true for, let's say, um, activists or civil society organizations working in exile. Um, these are really all concerns, and that is, at, at the end of the day, the ultimate purpose of surveillance, to silence dissent and to silence independent media reporting. However, after the Pegasus project, it had the opposite effect in the sense that people became, at least in the region, pe people became more aware um, about this threat. And I have to say, um, as we run this digital security helpline, we have more and more people coming to us, including journalists, to have their devices checked and scanned. So ultimately, it led to this awareness led to people thinking about their, their digital security and prioritizing that, where that wasn't necessarily the case, especially for journalists that are working under capacity or with limited resources. Uh, now, digital security has become front and center. So that is a good that's a good outcome. In you know, it's a it's a blessing in the in the midst of this uh, ongoing scandal. Um, so I mean, I hope this leads to more exposing of of these spyware companies and also that journalists and others um, find ways to protect themselves and their resources. If I could uh, just add from the, the investment yes, front. Yes, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, from the investment front as well. I mean, there in terms of limited positive outcomes, you know, following sort of the the um, the Pegasus project and the, the huge controversies and the financial implosion of NSO Group, um, definitely in conversations with both public and private equity uh, investors, there was sort of a, uh, a stain around anything that had to do with spyware. And so when we would talk to um, asset owners and asset managers, they would go to great lengths to talk about how they are consciously avoiding spyware. The problem, of course, with this is that spyware is not typically marketed as spyware. It's done under the rubric of law enforcement or counterterrorism. And so um, a big challenge for us, including over the next year, is really educating uh, investors about how spyware shows up in its different forms um, in their portfolios. Thank you, Sam, and I fully agree with uh, Marwa that digital security should be uh, our focus uh, to not give any opportunity for uh, hackers or companies to uh, get into our accounts and also to protect uh, our colleagues, our companies, our information. Now uh, we are in the final minutes, so I, I don't know, Asya, do you want to say something, the final say for one minute? Before we conclude, yes. Uh, thank you all for all the questions, uh, and thank you, Khalid, for this session. Actually, it was great to hear from you about all this uh, threat and uh, surveillance. Um, it's uh, actually a happy moment and a sad moment at the same time that we are sharing the same uh, issues. Uh, we, I hope that all of who is attending this meeting uh, to work together, actually, uh, to face this uh, huge uh, threat against us as a human rights defenders and activists and journalists. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Asya. Sam, your final say. Are you optimistic that in two years, three years, we will end uh, this cooperation between companies and democracies, investors that we could hold to, into account? Yes, Sam. That's, that's the hope, but I think I just want to reiterate a critical point, and that is um, for investors that, are, that tend to be overwhelmed by different environmental, social, and governance issues, it's really human rights defender organizations, whether at the international level like Access Now um, or, or at the grassroots level that provide the critical information or can provide the critical information that investors use with companies on demonstrating that there are real human beings impacted by their investments and that it's their responsibility to take appropriate action. So. Um, really, you know, we depend on those civil society organizations for our own work. Thank you, Sam and Marwa, the coordinator of the MENA Coalition to Combat uh, Civilians. Your final say, Marwa. 
final say uh we have a huge job to do i'm not sure yeah. if two or three years would be sufficient but it's yeah. definitely a priority fight for us and many of our partners and um, as sam mentioned it's also one of our key goals to uh, map uh, surveillance technologies and spyware being used in the MENA region, including the companies, their investors, their corporate structures, as well as the human rights abuses facilitated by the use of these technologies. That for us is important um, for a number of reasons, for accountability, for um, investor, uh, investor advocates, for journalists, lawyers, litigators. Uh, we want to make that, you know, we want to expose that industry to the extent we can. Um, and to help others in this ecosystem hold these companies accountable. So it is an ongoing fight for those who would like to join our coalition. I mean, it's MENA focused, but as I, it's open to global and uh, local and regional organizations. Feel free to get in touch with us. And, um, you know, we're planning to revamp the coalition. So there will be more um, advocacy uh, campaigns next year, hopefully. So with that, I have to thank our distinguished speakers, uh, Samuel, Marwa, and Asye. Uh, thank you, all of you who are in the room, and uh, also a lot of thanks to people who followed us online. And with that, I wish you a nice day. Thank you.